Yes. <laughs> Definitely cut that. It's always sort of uh, difficult to know where to, where to start when you have a huge cast of people in front of you in the sense that um, there's so many different standards of, of playing and so forth. And uh, later on, uh, I was hoping that I could be joined by, you know, two people over here and two people over here of different ages and, and so forth, that uh, we could work on some tunes together with and uh, see how we can improve them. and. Uh, there's a lot of <coughs> there's a lot of um, a lot of psychology going on with playing the fiddle. Um, playing the fiddle can be a, a stressful kind of thing to do, um, and there can be th things that l can inhibit your playing and inhibit your enjoyment. And they would be technique difficulties that that get in the way of of letting the music flow from in here and here into the instrument without having to think about am I holding the fiddle properly or am I doing the bowing properly and uh, a lot of problems begin really with the bow because uh, the thing is that unless I'm talking about from a beginner's point of view and even from an adult's point of view as well or, or uh, more mature players, the thing is that people can be afraid of the bow in the sense that they don't want to make the scratchy sounds and all this kind of thing, which is kind of, uh, that's completely understandable and, but it's, it's not insurmountable. I mean, it, it's the first thing that needs to be actually gotten completely out of the way that you have no worries about your bowing. Uh, bowing can bring you so much, it can make it playing so much more enjoyable once you have the technique of it down to a fine art and uh, that you don't have to think about it anymore. And um, I mean, I know when you see classical music written, you see up bows and down bows and all that kind of stuff. Well, this, that is out of the question when you're playing traditional Irish music, in my view. And I think that, um, that it's, there's, there's no strict rules, but there are great guidelines that you can use uh, when you're playing and uh, they will help you to for, for, to the fulfilment and the enjoyment that you can have out of tunes and, and out of playing Irish music. And I would request that if you have any questions at all, it will help me a lot because any, any, anyone that throws a question at me, it will bring more information out of me. In other words, like it's hard to think of everything that I'd like to say just by talking alone. So if there are any questions at all along the way, please, please say the word. Yeah. the bow rest naturally or do you put pressure on it? Do you just say that, do you I absolutely... I put quite a bit of pressure on it. I put quite a bit of pressure on it um, because the thing is, you have to bring the sound out of the instrument. And if you're playing it very gently, uh, well, you'll bring a certain amount of the sound out of it, but you won't bring the, all the sound out of it. And also, if you're playing with others, and if you play gently, if your bowing is very gentle, you won't be able to hear yourself, and others won't be able to hear you in the ensemble of people that you're playing with. So it's very important to be able to play really loud, first of all. That's the first thing. Play as absolutely as loud as possible. Rule number one. Rule number two, practice when nobody else is listening. <laughs> That's very important because, uh, and, that, and that goes for mo mostly kids as well, because the thing is that if, if you're practicing and your mom or your dad or whoever, or your teacher is listening, you know what I mean? You feel like, I have to get this right, and you feel this in intense sort of discomfort, uh, which, which, which has to be put out the door as quickly as possible. I used to practice. And when I was practicing, my dad would come into the room and he'd say, that's either too fast or it was too slow or too, too this or too, too, too that. And it used to really annoy me. To which point that I would never play at all at home um, because of that, because of just, you know, putting pressure on me. But having said all that, yes, you have to lean on the bow good and strong, bring the full sound out of the instrument. I mean, bring out the full volume out of it. I mean, the thing is, it's grand. <laughs> This should be cleaned up by now, but anyway, apologies for that. But the thing is, yeah, you have to bring, bring the full sound out of the instrument and lean on it. And uh, with, with the bowing techniques we'll be talking about again in a while, I used to watch Sean Maguire. I thought Sean Maguire had the, the, the greatest bow hand of all time. And the, the limited amount of bow that he used when he was playing was extraordinary. And the sound that he brought out of the instrument was extraordinary for such little amount of the bow. <coughs> so I have, I kind of copied that to some degree, um, but I thought, I thought about it and I, I thought to myself, it's like, it's e economy of bowing, if you like, and, and yet you're still bringing out the full sound of the instrument, you know, so 
if you can see any uh, um, YouTube recordings of Sean McGuire, just look at the Boeing and it's mesmeric. Any other, any other questions at all? Yeah. Yes. Quite. Yeah. I mean, quite honestly, I don't know what what the idea is behind having the, the bow at that angle. I mean, I, I went to, to learn how to read one time, <clears throat> and I was holding the fiddle like this, and I was playing with the flats of my fingers, which is the real old traditional country style, if you like, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had I had that all wrong. And I was, you know, I was playing, well, I was whatever way I was holding the bow, I'm not really quite sure. I was holding it a bit too short up here as well, which, so Martin Rabbit, my teacher in Galway, I had to start all over again and start coming down with the tips of the fingers. But the, uh, the angle of the bow, I don't really know. I mean, I think hold it at full length and bring whatever sound you can out of it. But I'd say it's probably, there's probably good reason for the angle to be like that, but uh, some classical technician will probably be able to answer that better than I, but I really don't know or understand what the, the idea for that angle of the bow is. I really have no idea. <coughs> I wouldn't give it too much thought. It's, it's, it's the, how you use the bow, really, at the end of the day, and the wrist action. And when you're playing the fiddle, it should be from the wrist, not the full arm, in my view. It should be just wrist action. So like... Uh, So I'm using a very limited amount of bowing, but I'm still bringing out plenty of sound out of it. The, 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 the long sweeps are only really for more in the classical genre or for playing airs, if you like. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of slow airs. I mean, they're nice and everything like that, but um, I wouldn't be getting, you know, coming out in a sweat about them really, because the thing is that, that uh, they say that you really need to know the, the lyrics of the song and all that kind of stuff to get the right emphasis out in playing airs. And anyway, playing slow airs is not much fun, really, <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day. You can have far more fun playing if you're hornpipes, jigs and reels, you know? Anyway, any questions? Yes? You talked about the wrist, and then from a developer's perspective, mm -hmm. moving from when you start off playing at the beginning, it, you emphasize the, the full bow. Yes. And now, to develop, to transition to mostly playing with the wrist, what techniques or suggestions would you have for making that transition? Okay, well, <clears throat> there's two ways of doing it. You can stand close to a wall with your, with, with this, with your right side and limit your space, limit your, your um, movement, or you can put a book under your arm and hold it there, and then you just you can't drop the book, so that it's, it's just, it sounds a bit funny and a bit silly, but th th those are two ways of doing it, and it sounds kind of funny as I say, but um, you could try it that way because the thing is that, um, as I say, if you limit your space there, or if there was somebody sitting right beside you there, you have to uh, you're, you're kind of you're kind of gagged for movement, so that's then it, it enforces you to to actually use your action bow action. So I'm kind of exaggerating it there a small bit. I'm pretending I have a book there. But if you do have a light, light book that you can hold under your arm there, and that would be a good way to, st to stop using the full sweep of the arm. It's, it's not really not necessary, and you can have... It's, it just takes up too much energy as well as everything else, and it's not necessary. Okay, so what we might do... Uh, if there's a few people of different ages and so on would like to sit up and, and we could go through some tunes and like we could uh, work on their technique or if there's a tune that you'd like to improve on, we can do that. Or two, two or three things. First of all, uh, you need to keep your fingers much closer to the strings. You don't need to lift them up so high. Just keep them right down there. Keep them really close to where you need them because they're no good to you up here. You need to keep them much closer to the strings, okay? So keep them very, very close to the strings, first of all, okay? Now, <coughs> you need to press harder on the strings. Have you, are your nails very long on, the on that side? They're not getting in your way, no? no? They're not too long, okay. Because sometimes 
ladies like girls like to have long nails and I'm afraid for playing the fiddle with the left hand you can, <laughs> the long nails is out the door because <laughs> you can't press the strings properly you have to be pressing them at an angle so you have to come down what you need to do is press much harder on the strings with your fingers just you could be strengthening your fingers like this when you're not playing just holding it like that and just doing each one of them and getting get them building up the muscles and the strength in your fingers and you have to press the strings a little bit harder a bit more firm and you certainly have to practice your bowing and play and hold it hold it more firmly and play as loud as possible so just but you need to get a nice little bit of rhythm in there because it's a little it's a little blank at the moment but you could if you play all your tunes hornpipes jigs and reels doing a bow to every note just for a while just for a while it will it will um, it will uh, shape up your bow hand quite a lot because it's it's the bow bowing is kind of in your way at the moment for some reason but i think if you if you play a bow to every, bow to every note as i say in every tune you know and try and get a nice bit of rhythm going in a nice bit dun, do, 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 and then as i say draw, drone a few of the notes together as well and how about rolls have you got rolls figured out Why aren't you using them? <laughs> I don't know. I was trying okay. to use them a bit, but maybe they didn't. Okay. Really that much. Okay. All right. Okay. All but right. Uh, and it's the fear of it as well. There's, 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 there is there's an, a fear in our head when we when we start playing, or when we're not too long at it, or whatever number of years we're at it. <laughs> that these things can inhibit us from 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 um, from getting to the next phase. Yes. But I think <clears throat> it would be a good idea to to do. I mean, I'm not. I'm, you know. I'm not trying to offend you by any stretch oh, of the imagination, okay. But I mean, I'd nearly, I'd nearly start just doing the entire scales, but make sure that every note is absolutely in key. You know what I mean? That's the only thing. I mean, and you'd nearly, you, could, you know, you could have a tuner in front of you and stop at the note C or something and see are you in tune. You know what I mean? Yeah. Stop along the way. And just keep correcting yourself that way. Yeah. Because until such time as you're playing in tune, with yourself and it's, you're in tune with the instrument itself, right? That the fingering is accurate. All tunes won't sound right. Yes, I understand. Do you know what I mean? And then you'll be always kind of stuck, yes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, not at all. We'll come back again. How are you? When you're starting that, you go, well, you should go. Huh? Lean in right away, yeah. So do that. And just. Yeah, just just wrist like for C sharp. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay, that's it, yeah. Now now the thing is back to the bowing there, right? Your bowing is really quiet, it's it's like skimping across the top of the strings. Yeah. That has to stop. <laughs> really, honest to God, you know, you can't. It's not always like that, though. Well, that's really terrible. <laughs> well, don't, don't be. <laughs> don't be, don't be, don't be. No, but I mean, the thing is that. I was saying that like to everybody. I mean, you really have to bring a, the massive, maximum volume out of the instrument, you know? And if you do that, I mean, if you start, before you start playing a tune at all, <clears throat> checking your tuning and, and doing these big, long, loud, loud strokes, right? And double stops and, you know what I mean? Like, uh, that type of thing. And just, it's, 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 you have to command, take control of the instrument. You can't have the instrument controlling you. Do you know what I mean? This, everything I'm saying here applies to everybody. You can't let the instrument control you, and you just have to be completely in control of it at all times, or it'll just go all askew, you know? Um, and it'll, it'll just get too scattered, and uh, you know, what you're, try what you're trying to achieve just won't go anywhere, because <laughs> there's certain things that are <laughs> stopping you from getting there, you know? So, <clears throat> plenty of, of, of uh, bowing techniques, and then... <coughs> And do try a bow to every note as well for, with that same tune. When you're holding the bow here, I think you're ho holding it a bit like that. You won't, get, you won't be able to get too much weight or pressure okay. holding it that way. You're near, I'm, I hold mine in there, 
So I have it between the first and second joints of my first finger. That's where I have it. And that's where you can really lean on it that way. If I had it like that, I can't lean on it. You just can't. F technically, physically, you can't do it. <laughs> resonate a lot of the strings together as well when you're playing because it just fills out the whole and colours it in a small bit more, you know? So, and you can bring a nice little bit of a bounce into it as well, a nice bit and you can switch your volume in and out as well, you know what I mean? You can bring it up the volume and tone it back a bit as well, you know? rather than just having it, you're playing very, at just very one safe level at the moment, right? That has to stop. <laughs> right, any questions from the house? How close to the bridge do you put the ball? Uh, I'm, more, I'm more to the, the top of the, the, the fingerboard. I'm closer to the fingerboard than I am to the bridge. Okay. But, but you, can, you, can bring, you can bring it up as well. The, for a sp certain kind of a tone, so you can get a, a more of an edge off the sound. You can get, a, get a, a more brittle sound off it if you want to come up a bit closer to the bow. You'd see that in classical players as well. They, they'll, they'll go up there occasionally as well because it's, it's for a special sound effect, you know. I stay away from it myself, <laughs> to be on the safe side, <laughs> in case I'd be eating my own words. How do you stop a bow bouncing? How do you stop it bouncing? Hold, certainly hold the fiddle in, uh, the bow in here between the, the, the knuckle and the first joint. That's the first thing. And lean on it. You can't, if I do that, you see? Too light, that shouldn't be happening. I mean, really, the bow, the, the stick is pretty much resting on the hair when I'm playing, you know? So, there's no space for it to bounce, you know what I mean? Okay, so that's, that's an absolute must, I'd say. You, ca you, you can't just play loudly all the time. I mean, it so that sounds a bit vulgar, but it's not, it doesn't meant to, it, 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 this is very important that you play really, really loudly all the time and very strong, you know, very firm. You, I'm gonna get you to play a few tunes in a minute if you don't mind. Is that okay? All right, good lad. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's after after he, after I'm he, a right. Well, I bet they are. Well, yeah. this needs this need this needs to be rehaired as well. You know, <clears throat> the thing is, like, if 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 the hair has been broken all the time like that, it's it's either one or two things. You're playing in a very noisy place where where, where yeah. the person can't be heard, like in a pub, on a pub scene or whatever. You know what I mean? Be better off <coughs> having some sort of a proper uh, proper pickup or something like that. I have a I have a sound system which is inside in the fiddle, which plugs in here. It's not cheap now, mind you. It's about five hundred quid, but you can then you, it's then you can play at a very comfortable level and you can just turn up the volume <coughs> really. But if he's play, is it he or she is playing in? A, are you playing in, in in a pub? Yeah. Is it like in a pub, oh, yeah. noisy pub? Yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, well, once they start breaking it all, then the, the rest seem to, yeah. the rest seem to follow, you know. Mm. But I suppose it could be um, there again, down to down to. to oh, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the chip? <laughs> he loves to see you coming back. <laughs> oh Jesus, she's back again. That's great. Another fifty quid. How much? How much is it fifty quid? Oh, mother. I'm constantly going for feelings, uh, you know, yeah. in my rehair. Yeah. Place. I think I'm told because I'm putting the emphasis, I'm, I'm going too much onto the water. It's a technical thing. Yeah, oh. 
Oh, thank God. But I take a point, once you lose one, you lose. Yeah, they start, they start all tumbling out. I mean, I'm going to get this bow rehaired soon, as you can see. But it could be a year and a half before I get it done again, though. Yeah, well, see. Do you know? Yeah, it is. There was a friend of mine that had actually made, it, made a system which made it quite easy to do. But, uh, and he gave me one of them. I'm not a very <laughs> skilled person. Of fig but um, I don't know, to be quite honest. It's a, it's a tricky enough job. You, know, you have to do it about do it about a hundred times before you get it right, I'd say, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jig, yes. Yeah. Have you the fiddle there, which I have you? Yeah? I do. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want? Do you want to come down and? Yeah, I don't know. I have. I don't let not her, so yeah. Okay. So All right. So, okay. Well, give me, give, give me your, give me your question again about the jig. Um, what's, the, what's the jig? Um, do I know it? Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. To get the middle ground, yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, I mean, your background is in classical, right? Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, <clears throat> when you're reading an Irish tune, you're reading it through sort of classical eyes, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. In other words, like you're approaching it, perhaps, uh, you know, like as if it was a, a sheet music when you're sitting up with an orchestra or something, you're reading it the same way. It's actually a different interpretation altogether. It, it, it plays a lot different than it reads. Now, I don't read music. I mean, I know the notes, but I, I don't know how to put in the timing and all that kind of stuff. But we'd say, was one of the tunes there... So, I mean... Uh, I'll play it and then we'll have a quick chat about it. The way, that's the way I'd play it. Is that anything like the way you're doing it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. I didn't mean that to sound like it sounded. <laughs> so there's, there's fierce puns on words here. But uh, so I suppose you have to get a little bit of a jaunt and a little bit of a lilt into it. And, uh, and also you can, as it, you can swell in the volume in and out like that as well, you know what I mean? Like I was doing. So let's see. Uh, I'll play, I'll play Farla Gara and, and see, see, does one thing cancel out the other?
myself, I, it's, not, it's not inhibiting me in any way, I'm, but I'm still holding it, I'm very aware that I'm holding it tightly, you know. But I suppose it's just, um, as you don't really have to use a lot of the bow when you're playing jigs and reels, and in fact the less you use of it the better, because the thing is you can you, you kick more rhythm and more, um, well, a bit more of a lilt and, and rhythm into, into the playing, funnily enough, you know. So big, I mean, big long bowing strokes are a kind of a waste of energy, really, to a large degree. I mean, you could just tighten up, tighten up your bowing as much as possible, and fa fairly minimalistic stuff. But I mean, the thing is that I'm putting a lot of triplets in there, as well as rolls. I'm doing a lot of dum 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 I mean, you know, if we all played the same way as we were dowdling the tune, say for I'm dowdling the tune, dum We don't play like that, but I try to. That's what I try and do: is play the same way as you dowdle the tune, and that brings out the, the rhythm and the, the joy and the, and the uplift of the tune itself. Yeah, fiddle for one second till I just have a peek at something here. Um, okay, I, 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 or unless I'm mistaken, the, the, your, the sound post in there needs to be a little bit closer to the back, of, a little bit closer to the back of this bridge here. You see, it's, it's, it's a little bit too far back. In my view, in my view, it's, it's, you see with the little, um, see with the little, the little notches there in the fiddle, right? The back of the bow, the back of the bridge rather, where's my glasses? The back of the bridge should be in line with that, right? And then the sound post should be directly behind that, that right pillar, right, right in there. I think it'll bring, it'll bring out a nicer sound out of the instrument as well, because it's a nice looking, nice instrument. And I think it's, the sound is kind of gagged in there, a the small bit. Anyway, that's another subject altogether. I just thought I'd mention it to you. Um, so, huh? Oh, it's grand, yeah, but I mean, you'll get a nice, there'll be a nicer tone out of it if, if, the, if the bridge is brought a little bit forward. The back of the bridge should be in line with these little notches here, yeah? The, oh. the very back, yeah? In line with these little notches. And then your sound post then needs to be immediately behind this, this pillar here. Straight behind it, okay? Somebody will do it in 10 minutes. In the that, shop. Really, anyway. that part there. Once you get the tune into your head, dump the notes, mm. you know, because if you keep looking at the notes, you'll be just, you know, you'll be just connecting with the notes and the fingers and the bow and there's nothing coming from in here really. Once, you know what I mean? It just, the notes get in the way after a while of, of, of you know, your feeling for the music and, and what you're playing. You know, it really does because it, 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 it gets in the way of your enjoyment of it, you know? So once you have the tune off, I mean, could you play that tune without reading it? Yeah, so I mean, the, thing, the best thing to do is like get the tune off, then throw away the sheet music, you know what I mean? And don't bother going back to it, do you know what I mean? Because once you start reading it again, it'll just, it'll make you play in a particular way because you're just playing all the notes and there's nothing coming from in here and nothing coming from, from here to here to the, to the fingers and so on. And can you okay. do more short rolls? Like, see the way this would be here. And can you only do one short roll or is it over the top to do more? Or? No, I mean, that's, that's, that's I mean, You can only put in the roles where, where, the, where they can be put in, if you know what I'm trying to say. But it's a good tune. What's that kind of called? overdefine it, first of all, and then you can pull back from that as small bit. So in other words, like, exaggerate the, in, in the emphasis of what I'm talking about. It's like you're, you're really spelling it out to somebody. That type of thing. And then you, when you pull back from that a small bit, it just becomes really nice then. It goes, it's kind of, a lightheartedness kicks in then, and that's where the fun and the joy is in it. Questions? Any question from the house? Yes. Uh, it's it's a German. It's a German copy of a 
a Garnelius, and um, it's a man by the name of Guter, G-U-T-T-E-R, made it in, I don't know where it was made, to be honest with you, it's probably in there somewhere. But it's a, as I say, it's a copy of a Garnelius, and I remember one time uh, I was doing gigs with Stefan Grappelli, the great jazz, great jazz violinist, the late great jazz violinist, and he had the real thing. <laughs> he had the Garnelius and I had the copy. <laughs> But we still had good fun playing together though, you know. And I got to play, I got to play um, in Washington, this, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., uh, the Smithsonian Institute. I got invited in there to one time. They have three Strad violins there. And they have um, Fritz Chrysler's Garnerius is there as well. And out of all the, the fiddles, Chrysler's um, Garnerius was the, was the real thing, I thought. I, did, I wouldn't give tuppence for the strands, but I mean, they're, they're, you know, obviously they're worth the fortune and all the rest of it. <laughs> it didn't sound any good to me. <coughs> they didn't sound, no, I mean, they didn't sound, I mean, this, this isn't, uh, I, I, I bought this fiddle for about 150 quid about 150 years ago. Um, <laughs> uh, about, about 35 years ago, 40 years ago. And um, it's 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 been it's getting better all the time. The sound of it is getting better. I give it a lot of work, obviously, but uh, it's nothing. It's nothing very special, and it's nothing. You know, it's not a priceless violin or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination. But um, I mean, you can spend a fortune buying a, buying a fiddle, and it's I don't know. I mean, I've played instruments belonging to other people that they've spent you know ten, fifteen, and twenty thousand on. And like, it's mad money. And it, for me, it, the, the sound of it just didn't do it for me. Like, but I mean, like a, a lot of classical players, obviously, will pay, pay an awful lot of money for, for, um, for violins. You know what I mean? The violin and fiddle is the same thing, like, let's face it. But um, I mean, I've played fiddles that were about 150 euros worth, and they sounded really good. And I've played fiddles that were about 15,000. And the 150 euro one sounded better to my ears. It just and it felt nicer to play and everything. So it's. Um, I have um, there's, a, there's a fiddle maker in, in the states that I got a fiddle made from, and his name is. Um, um, what's his name? <laughs> um, Dexter, is his name. But he makes makes violins. He, he just did, started as a hobby, you know, and they're really fantastic fiddles. They're really good, really good. So I have one of those to, uh, as a spare, but I just play this one all the time because it's just, it's easy. And also, another thing that people might want to remember, a lot of people's fiddles, they have, the, the strings are so high off the strings, off the fingerboard, excuse me. They're really high and uncomfortable. I don't know what yours are like now, but mine are really, I keep, the, I have the bridge as, well, I, I had the, the fingerboard reshot to, 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 to rise up a small bit like this because I didn't like the, the tension on the strings to be so high. And so they're just so comfortable to play and a lot of people have their, their, their strings are so high up off the, off the fingerboard and it's really it's sore and you get pains in the backs of your fingers, you know? And it's very uncomfortable. I don't know if you've noticed that, if, and, you know? But anyway, keep the, the, the strings, or keep the fingerboard and the strings as close together as possible, is my advice. And you can have far more fun playing the fiddle and, and uh, you won't get a pain in your left hand either. But you will for a while when you're doing these new exercises I'm giving you. That's right. <laughs> As I keep saying, try these new bowing techniques now when you go home, right, or whatever, and just like tighten up the bowing altogether. Okay. Play as loud as possible, and and do these exercises when there's nobody around, when there's nobody listening, because you know you'll you'll be you'll be self-conscious about the fact that somebody else is listening, and you won't you won't take the risks and you won't make the noise. Do you know what I'm saying? You won't make the bring out the level of volume that you need to do. You know. Any question? Yes. Absolutely no. I mean, you can play a hornpipe slow. I mean, it's, it's all a matter of preference. Um, I mean, there's obviously, a, you, you can play a hornpipe up to the speed of a reel, you know what I mean, if you want, you know? But uh, it's all to do with the lilt and the, and the kind of the enjoyment that, that you bring into the tune. Um, there's a lovely hornpipe called the Harp and Shamrock. Uh, and you can play it in two or three different keys. I'll start playing it in D, and then I'll go into A, I think, and then G, or something like that. Anyway, but it's a lovely tune, and you can play it, uh, you can play it. Or. Now, 
a hornpipe like that, which is a kind of a contemplative kind of a tune, it's, it, there's, a, there's a nice thought process going through it. You know what I mean? There's a, it's, it starts in a lovely place and goes off to a lovely place, you know? A lot of other hornpipes are fairly, well, they're just a hornpipe, you know what I mean? And uh, they're nice tunes. But there's certain tunes like this harp and shamrock, I think is it, there's a con contemplative aspect to it. And I think in that case, a nice, comfortable, slow pace, because it, there's, a kind of a, there's a lot of depth in the tune. Oh, I'll play that one and then I'll play something else to compare it with in a minute. That's a lovely hornpipe, and it's a fairly recently written tune. Um, I think uh, some McCarthy man from Cork and Pat, uh, yes. huh? Pat, Crowley. Pat Crowley and somebody is that Pat Crowley and Maca Pat Crowley anyway. Isn't he the piano player and keyboard player? Is it? Yeah. That's the same Pat. I think so. Yeah, lovely tune, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, so that'd be those kind of hornpipes are kind of unusual in the sense that I said there's a kind of a contemplative element to them. Um, wait, let's see. Uh, I mean, say for example, if you do this one. Kind of a more a <laughs> thank you. It's kind of a, it's a, a you can it's a bit more sporting and a bit more frolicking kind of tune. You know, you can play around and have a bit of fun with it. And it doesn't you're not going to do it any harm. You know what I mean? But um, so it's entirely up to yourself, really. I mean you, that that mightn't sound near as fun to play it. You know what I mean? It kind of. It kind of gets into a depressed mode there when you play it at that pace, so it's better off play, playing it a bit fast. Maybe the tune isn't great and you have to play it faster to make something out of it. I don't know. <laughs> it seems like I haven't played it since either, by the way, but the way I played that was fairly hopeless. But um, to answer the rest of your question, um, I, I, no, I had no sort of great grand plan until I was about 14, about 15, I'd say. I'd say I was about 14 or 15 years of age when I, I absolutely made, made up my mind that it was music was going to be for me. Um, school was a pain and uh, 
just, you know, and funnily enough, you know, at that time as well, like playing Irish music and going to secondary school in Galway, they didn't really go hand in hand at all because, I mean, you were made little of and mocked because you played jigs and reels. I mean, it was just like, it was really looked down upon and frowned upon. Uh, which I suppose had, you know, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to beat that system and anyway. I'm going to knock that out of the air at some point in time because I just felt that it was so wrong that so many people, so many Irish people, had this distinct sort of hatred for Irish music for some reason. I don't know, it's probably a historical or whatever the case may be. But um, for a long time, for many, many years and too long, Irish music was held in, with serious sort of, you know, like, God almighty, like, you know, this kind of, the, the, the term diddly I didn't even come into it at that time. It was just like, it was just disliked and that was the end of it. You know, you play, oh God, you know. You And then, but I said to my father one day, I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play professionally. And he says, oh, God almighty. I mean, he's, <laughs> his heart sunk. His heart sunk. He was, you know, he said, look, at, he says, look, at, it's great to be able to play music. And it's a wonderful passport to bring you anywhere here. And you meet lovely company and all the rest of it. <laughs> but for God's sake, don't try and make a living out of it. Because the poor creatures that he saw trying to make a living out of it arrived on a bicycle with a fiddle under their coat for a few free pints in our pub in Corndulla in the darkness of night, you know, travelling in minstrels. That's the only kind of musicians that he knew, you know, apart from the odd local person who could play a bit and the man that taught him, Packy Ford, you know. So there's very few people playing it and, and uh, I, I felt at a very early age that I really wanted to try and change that around. F just for myself for a start off, and, you know, and if it affected everybody else, then all the better. But uh, that, it's, it certainly has come full circle. I mean, the, the amount of people everywhere across the globe playing Irish music, and especially in Ireland. And the, I saw a young band playing last night. They were called Cooig or something, right? They're from, I think, from, from the north somewhere. And like, they're like 13, 14, and 15 years of age, right? And I'm telling you something, I never heard the like of it. They were just incredible, just really good. And I was at the Fly and Derry, and I saw all these young people playing, like, and it's, it's frightening now, the, the standards and where it's all come, come to. It's just brilliant. So it's a joy and I'm delighted, you know, so that's a great question. Um, well, you practice for as long as you feel like practicing, first of all. And you'll pr if you're really enjoying yourself, your time will fly. Uh, you know, it's the same as if you were on um, Nintendo or something like that. You, the amount of time or or on an iPad or something, the amount of time that'll pass if you're enjoying yourself, you know what I mean? If you're, you're, if you're really um, into what you're doing and you're enjoying it and that, rather than, practice when you, when, when you want to. Don't, if you feel that you have to practice, it's a kind of, it's an awkward one. Say, decide to practice yourself and don't wait for somebody to tell you to practice because then you feel like, Right, okay. It's like, it becomes a kind of a chore, a kind of a homework thing. You have to get that out of your mind. That has to go. You have to think, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out the fiddle and play a tune. That's what I'm going to do. So if you come at it from that kind of a psychology, you'll have a lot more fun with it. And then practice for as long as you feel until you get tired, I suppose, you know. But enjoyment is the most important thing. And, and decide to practice yourself rather than, <coughs> rather than have somebody else telling you. Sorry, Colin. Yeah. I don't know, but I think you put an idea into my head, though. Yes, honest to God, it never even occurred to me until you. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I, I did. Have you have a, have a question about it? Well, uh, you, since I've arrived, you've been talking about dance music all the time. Yes. The joy of it and so on. Yeah. But there is this wonderful treasure of slow airs. And yeah. That's a uh, wonderful art to do it properly. It, I quote the famous Samuel Johnson. He said, The Irish were a funny race. All their wars are merry and all their songs are sad. <laughs> so the slow airs yeah. is the outside of that coin. It's the, the enjoyment of dance music, but the slow airs can be very. Well, the, of course they can, yeah. But the, I was saying at the beginning that I, generally speaking, I, I play one or two airs. Not, I, I'd, I'd say there's two airs that I would play, and that that'd be about it. Um, for a number of reasons, the, I, the reason why I first developed a hang-up about playing slow airs was uh, my father. When I play an air, my father was a very emotional man, really emotional, 
And in, well, when anyone would play a slow air, the tears would start pouring down his face. <laughs> now, I thought this is, this is true as God. <laughs> that's what I thought, and that's why I don't play, and that's why I don't play slow airs. <laughs> no, but it actually did put me off for a while. You know what I mean? But it just had I had I had I known the amount of had I understood at an earlier age what it meant to him to hear a slow air. Although it made him cry, it, it, it brought him great joy as well. And had I known that a bit earlier, I'd have played a lot more slow airs, even if he was crying, you know what I mean? Because I knew that it brought him so much comfort and pleasure. But I've played more airs now than, since he's passed away than I ever did when I was growing up. But a playing of a slow air, they say that you need to know the, 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 yes, the lyrics and all that to really understand how to play it. But uh, playing a slow air, is not the easiest thing. I mean, you need really good technique. I mean, you need I, I, almost to the point of really good classical training. Right. To, I think so. Yeah, because in order to get that sort of lovely distance and long notes and long bone, long great um, quality of, of sound, and to be able to emphasize the air in the correct places and everything, it, that is a serious technique of his own. And I'd say it would really almost demand classical training for it. But, um, I mean, as I say, like, I, I generally speaking, I kind of steer, steer clear of them. Although there are some like, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful airs. A couple of choice. Would the cooler be one? The yeah, I, I don't know. I don't play the, I, well, I, pl I know it, but I, the, it, that wouldn't be one that I, I could, I can play it. Um, I play, she lived beside the Anna at the foot of Schlieve Naman. That's what I play usually. They're, they're a tough old station, the air, you know what I mean? But I mean, I'd be using sort of phrasing there now that like a Shano singer would use, you know what I mean? And it's, it's a, there are special effects, if you like, and it's almost, it's almost like very close to the blues as well. There's a kind of a, th yeah, there's, a, there's, there's phrasing that you'll hear in Shano singing and there's phrasing that you'll hear in blues and stuff like that, they're, they're, and they're close, they're close, or even in Indian singing and, and, and Middle and Far Eastern stuff, it's, it's extraordinary, but I wouldn't be that comfortable playing airs. I'm, I'm fairly comfortable playing that one, you know, but, uh, but there again, I don't have the really long bowing techniques. I'd be more on the, the speedy factor. So you play to your strength, so uh, <laughs> that's why I got there strong. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Colin. So anyway, I hope uh, you all got something out of it, don't yes. And uh, we'll see you another time, please God. <laughs> Bow to every note yeah. for a while, play as loud as possible, really loud, and get a good grip of the bow, and don't be afraid of it. You won't break the fiddle. <laughs> Thanks very much.